All right, guys, we're. I lost you for a little bit, but that was because of my book. So I'm trying to go back to sharing screen and writing process. Aha, there we are. Yeah. Oh, so we are. Yeah. It's unworthy, right? I know I didn't upload it. I hate you for being. I don't know how to get this to show. Um, all right, guys, we're back. I see Kira. I do not see Vera. There's nobody in Montego Bay. But we're going to just press ahead now. We're going to continue with the writing process. And Okay. Yeah. Okay, right. So now I'm done. I was just praying about something. Wait, wait. Oh, you're a doormat. Doormat. Okay. All right, guys. So when we broke a while ago, Norma joined us. So she's here saying hi. But we're going to just pick up with the writing process. In the first, before the break, we looked at, and you know, there's something I wanted to go with us about looking at great, great teacher for all of that at the time. So we've missed something that we should have done, and we looked at the nature of writing, and we're going to continue now by looking at the writing process. And I mentioned earlier that the even though writing is process oriented it doesn't necessarily follow a linear um, pattern it doesn't move from point one to point ten because persons have different writing styles so we are going to go back into our writing at different points and do different types of corrections and adjustments so we're looking now at one approach to the writing process but this is by no means the only approach to the writing process, right? So, when you issue a task, are your students eager to, to write? Um, and here, you know, I you do, you do Spanish. Your students are eager to write when they have writing tasks? Most times, no. Most times, no. And I'm suspecting you have the same experience. And you say, what, what subject do you teach? No, oh, you teach, so you teach all subjects. So, do they love writing? Well, actually, I generate their writing. What do you mean? You, you discuss it. Oh. And I tell them, me, we get into a conversation. Mm -hmm. and Wait, one second. Can you hear, can you hear us here? Can you hear Dharma speaking? I can um, hear part of it. Yeah, I can hear her. 
Okay, so she'll speak more loudly. Okay, it's like we, we discuss the topic, allow the students to give their opinion, their views, and actually at the end, the writing task is being given to them. So they actually just wrote what they discussed. Discuss. Okay, and I don't it works. This it works. It works, okay. Now, I'm a lot of instances, when you actually give students writing tasks, they don't understand that there is any sort of value to this writing. So they're left to ask you, why are we, why are we doing this? What was the purpose of this? It's just like sometimes you hear students ask, why are I doing math? Like everyone was doing math. So in a lot of instances, they're going to ask you, what is the purpose? Will I ever use this skill? Fortunately for us, we can say yes. It's likely that you will use this skill at some, this writing skill at some point, right? So there is value. And we need to let them become aware of the value of writing and how they need to find their own voice and their own style to add to that value that so makes it relevant to them and the person who read. Sometimes they ask, who cares about what I write? I mean, you might pretend that it's dead. Because you will mark students' work and sometimes that's it, right? You give it back to them and they pass it out. They never look at what you recommend that they should do, which is why the journal becomes important. Because if they keep a journal, then they keep they can't pass it out. You can insist that they insert this type of this piece of writing in their portfolio or their journal. So when asked who cares about their writing, the first point really should be that they should care about what they generate. And then other persons, because they're writing for life. Right? When you write, when you generate writing, no, it really is intended as students to build these skills so that when you get outside of the classroom, you can function as a literate member of society. You're going to work, you're going to be a part of a club, you're going to be a part of a church. What if you become the church secretary? Yeah? In the club, what if you are the one who has to ensure that the notices are put up so that the other members can know when they have meetings? What if there's a change? You need to know that at work, for sure, there is going to be some type of writing expected. I'm sorry, there's some Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, that's good. On the board. Okay, sure. There's no specific place to put it, right? I'm sticking it here. Oh, no. Sorry. That's all right. Let's see, my two parents, man. So, question if I want. So, when I want a like, young person who's outside of the classroom to see that, what do I do? What's on the board? Because I have people online. Or this is not meant for me. I don't know. I'm just going to ask the team, but I'm right here. Oh, I see what you're saying. All right. Thanks, though. All right. All right, thanks. Um, another question that I'd like to ask, even if they don't ask it out loud, does my writing at this level affect anyone other than myself? By the way, Kira, are you seeing the screen? You're seeing the PowerPoint? I can. Okay, all right. So does my writing at this level affect anyone other than myself? Because really, they're, even though you might give them an audience, uh, tell them who the audience should be and you tell them what the context should be and what the purpose is, who else is seeing it other than you? <laughs> or if something happens that is funny it, or ridiculous, then you might share it with a colleague. But for the most part, you see it. You want to see them? Yeah. So we have to let them become even if nobody else is seeing it immediately, but you have to probably encourage them. So when you have like parents' day, if parents come in for performance review, you let them display their best pieces of work or something that one of, um, one of my departments had done once. So we started newsletters, like a yearbook for grade nine, we were three out of them. So we started a newsletter. And we put students' work in the newsletter, it was very good. So, you know, this idea that they become published that other people will see their work can encourage. And perhaps the same can be done for French, Spanish. One thing that, for example, that their sign, their signage around the property, oh, you yes. can ask them to translate it and put it up in the other language. 
Yeah, and they can own that. That is something that they can do. That part that they can do as a class. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be sophisticated. It doesn't have to stay up forever. But they can just translate and put it out there, and that can, you know, give them the courage to write again. And so, for the rest of this, we really are going to be looking at how to respond to these questions for our students. How do we make them understand that there is value in their writing, that we really, what well, they should care about their writing, and then others will begin to care, and that it affects others other than just them. As students, their writing can affect other people. You could, for example, encourage them to submit their letters to the newspaper. There is a newspaper intended for students at the teenage, at the teenagers. Two newspapers at the teenage, and then there's children's own. Is there anything similar in St. Lucia? Newspapers that target students. Yes, there, there are two. There is one called the Yo in the, um, one of the main newspapers. It comes every weekend. And it's, mm -hmm. it has, well, youth, everything about youth. Yes, for them. Right, so you could encourage them, even if it is geography and history, they could write a review of something and submit it. And it becomes a part of the newspaper. So give them the idea that really their writing can affect other people. Right? And so we move on to the next slide. All right, so let your students know that writing is not a one-shot activity. And Dorma, you missed out on an activity that we did this morning. That's You're so sorry, I, I see it. <laughs> yeah. But writing is not a one-shot activity. There's no way you're going to write it right the first time. So we need to get beyond that space. And how do we, I want you to start thinking of the ways in which we can encourage our students to get beyond that notion that once they do it, that it is just one opportunity. They do it once and that should be a perfect thing. Because what we want them to understand is that it involves a process, right? And the process is going to be determined by their writing style, but these are some of the components of the process. And if they're willing to follow a process, then chances are they're going to be able to generate work that is satisfying for them and that you won't feel absolute horror at reading. All right, so the writing process in action. This is what we're going to be pretending to do now. So the assignment is for us to write an essay of 700 to 800 words in which you discuss a challenge you faced and tried to meet. Very similar to what we would have done at the beginning. At the beginning, remember that you were to do it in 250 words. So, yeah, that's come back. so in, at the beginning, you were to do that 250 words and in 10 minutes. Notice the absence here of a time constraint. So you're not time bound, but you have a word limit. Now let's look at the idea of um, audience, context, and the other one was purpose. So within that, are those things defined for you? Is there a purpose? Is there an audience? Is there a context? So which is there? Which are the ones that you have to determine for yourselves? Anybody who wants to speak? Uh, I know that there is purpose for you. You are writing a brief for my first um, I don't think that a part of the audience has been identified. So I don't know that it is specifically for your teachers for a group of or it might be from the book where we're interested in uh, weightlifting or losing weight, losing weight is being so healthy. Mm -hmm. Losing weight or just a physical activity to be as, it's not defined. It's not defined. So pretty much what that means is that as the writer, you get to make that decision. Mm -hmm. But at the beginning, I right. used to that you had to know, look at your vast experiences and try to narrow it down to one challenge, right? So, even though we have an idea of what is expected, it doesn't define it because we're leaving that up to the writer. We want to encourage that personal touch. Right? Let me go back to share screen. I wish there was a way to just do this. You know, like when you want to see it and then just walk over and touch the screen. All right, so. <laughs> so the topic 
Weightlifting for women who want to build up their strength. So remember, it's a challenge that you face and met. The topic we're looking at is weightlifting for women who want to build up their strength. And the purpose, to inform, to persuade. So essentially, when we go all the way down now, do we now have the purpose, the context, the audience? The audience would be the person who are interested in women. Women who want to build up their strength. So it's women, you want to speak to women who want to build up their strength specifically, and you want to suggest to them that perhaps weightlifting is what they can use to accomplish this. So you want to tell them, come on, some weights. Lift some weights, right? Everybody's with me? Kira, Lira, is Carrie on back? I didn't see her just now. Carrie Ann, oh, there you are. Okay. And go back to this. See, we really need to get to the point of others walk up and touch. Okay, so let's generate some ideas for this topic. And one of the, in the writing process, a pre writing activity, we're looking at this supposed linear process, a pre writing activity includes brainstorming, free writing, mapping, and the journalist's questions, right? Now, brainstorming, which I'm hearing these days is pointless, especially in the workplace, where everybody comes together and share their ideas and then nothing happens. That's why it becomes pointless. But that's not for us. So if you're brainstorming about this idea that women, do I need to go back to the screen before? Okay, so women, no, I need to, women who need to, I need to go back to the screen. Okay, so weightlifting for women who want to build up their strengths. So if we're brainstorming, what are the things that we want to include in this essay that we're writing? We don't have to come up with ideas, no, just think about them, yeah? So brainstorming, and you just document those ideas. You don't have to write them in a particular fashion. You just put them down on paper as they come to your mind. So whether it is going to be something that contributes to the notion that there is a benefit from lifting weight, or it is something that is going to actually detract from that. Because one of the arguments against weight lifting is that you might end up with too bulky, your muscles might end up too bulky, and you might look mannish, and all sorts of things become relevant, but are they necessarily going to inform what you write? Right? Once you have brainstormed now, one of the things that you can go in to do, you can go into this brainstorming session and take from that is mapping, webbing, or tree diagram. You know how to do that? The next slide will show you. This is an example of mapping, right? So women training to lift weights, notice that is in the center. And then around it, so these are the things that would have come up from the brainstorming, right? So once you have done the mapping, then there you can now engage in free writing or you could just avoid the whole idea of brain, brain, um, brainstorming and mapping and go right into free writing. You could just jump in and write, but you'll have to go back and make some changes and whatnot. And then another approach is the journalist questions. And these are going to be the WH questions. Where, when, why, what, and whatever else becomes what I want. All right, so let's look at the sample, the example of the mapping. So in the center, at the core of this, women training to lift weights. And what are the considerations that come out? You might end up with, um, <laughs> so, women, according to this, women have no overly masculine muscles. You don't want that to end up with these masculine, bulky muscles as a female. Something else to consider is safety, personal goals. So, what do you want to accomplish from this? And then there are physical considerations, which I guess are also related to not wanting those bulky muscles. There's nothing to know over the bulky muscles. Let's leave that alone and let's start here at the physical stuff. So, 
if you're going to consider this seriously as a way to increase your strength, then you want to begin according to this with the easy stuff. You might want to lift eight pounds, sorry, maybe that's not, let's say on five. So you want to lift five pounds and then you gradually move up and you build repetition of, you know, so maybe you start out doing sets of eight and then after a week you can move up to sets of 16 and then before you know it you need to increase your weight sizes and you've gone up to 10 pound weights and you're building again the number of repetitions that you're doing because you know you have that goal in mind you're strengthening strength made, right another consideration personal goal so you want to increase your upper body strength and that means that you're going to have to isolate your muscle groups. So you're going to have to do biceps and triceps, and <laughs> which means you can't always just be lifting like this. You have to lift some in front, and there is this curl from behind. Yeah, I saw a person who fell off the boat. <laughs> you have to really learn to isolate the muscle groups so that you're not just focusing on one set and ignoring the others. And then again, on the personal goal individual focus you might focus on the neck and again as female you don't want to get you know that little look <laughs> you don't want to get that back here <laughs> right. and then you're going to want to work on your legs and thighs as well because guess what you have in the upper body strength but you don't want to appear and also be strong yes you want to tighten your core and you know work on the rest of your body so your legs and back will have to get some focus here fingers and hands, and then there's a particular way, but we're talking about safety you now, but there's a particular way to lift weights. So you have to ensure that if you're going to do this, you bend with your knees and keep your back straight, even no matter what life it is, I learned that, yeah. So whatever it is that you're lifting, you might have to approach it with the, proper, the appropriate safety precautions. So whether it is barbells or dumbbells, where you're actually using a weight machine, then you have to be properly positioned or you can actually straight yourself, etc. So these are like, so what you'll notice here is that the ideas are grouped according to the concerns to which they are matched, right? So for the physical stuff, notice it relates to how to approach weightlifting. For the personal goals, you want to focus on upper body strength. That's one of the personal goals. The other one is focusing on individual parts of your body. And then another concern is safety. And look, you see that weight machines and barbells are related to that. So with mapping, you group ideas because that is how you're going to discuss them. So if we're actually building a par a paragraphs from this, we could easily end up with three different paragraphs that focus on women training to lift weights. Now, this has a very English slant to it, right? But could this work for a different subject? Let's say you get a question. Can you come Lira with a question for geography? If you had a question for geography, it doesn't have to be anything sophisticated. Let us say we want to talk about the impact of volcanoes on plants. That sounds sensible? No? Human life? Mm -hmm. Natural hazards, impact of volcanic eruptions on agricultural lands. Okay, all right, so I like that. So the impact of volcanic eruptions on agricultural mm -hmm. lands, right? No, that would be in the center where we have women training to lift weights. No, um, Lira, to be honest, I'm not even going to pretend so no. I suspect <laughs> that volcanic soil is fertile. I fertile. Mm -hmm. But that is long term, not immediate, right? Because if it's your own life, no, I suspect you have no agriculture. Right? Yes, right. no agri destruction of agricultural lands. All right, so, mm -hmm. that so where we have physical stuff, we could put destruction of agricultural lands. And then that, of course, is going to have an effect on the, on the farm up. It's going to have an effect on food supply. So particular crops are going to mm -hmm. be here so over a period of time. And so all of those ideas would end up right here. So you're visualizing this with you, right? Because I'm too lazy to go in and type it in. Okay. Another effect um, here. It doesn't have to be an immediate effect? No, not necessarily. We're just taking some random things. Okay, well, um, 
fertility of the soil, increase the soil fertility. All right. So we could say that over time, um, it increases soil fertility. And then there are particular, so would it affect like cash crops? I mean, crops that are, you want to grow quickly? Could we, yes. as you could plant these here, or are there particular types of crops that are suited to the volcanic soil and all of that? So all of that information about how it affects the soil mm -hmm. would be included right about here. So we can stop because we get the general idea, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, French and Spanish. Do we have an opportunity in your writing situational like when you're doing situational responses? Is there any opportunity to use this mapping to get students to organize their ideas? Let's say they're going to the supermarket. You want them to go to the supermarket and purchase. I would use I would use, use this one to do it because all right. When you're giving them essays to write mm -hmm. or uh, stories. Which, which is more of a case level, then you could use the concept map and it still would be like teaching them English. Right. So it's similar in that way. So for the others, uh, I think I'm it would I work. Don't know, I don't know about Kira, but I yeah. don't think it would work. Okay. So Kira, would it work for you? I don't think so because I think the level that they are at. The kind of Spanish I expect them to produce it is not anything as complicated as that. Okay. All right. So let's see if there's anything else after that that might work. So brainstorming. So we're still looking at this idea of that your females lifting irons, lifting weights to build strength, to increase strength, and brainstorming. Now, and you, even though these are written down so neatly. Under normal circumstances, when they brainstorm, well, when I brainstorm, they're all over the place. And I do not use notebooks with sets already. And that was open and I start writing on it in that page. So imagine how my brainstorm would look, right? So this neat arrangement is not necessary. But some of the ideas from our brainstorming session would include any or all of these. So over the masculine muscles must be guarded against. That, I mean, once you see, as a female, once somebody mentions weight, that's perhaps one of the first things that comes to mind, right? And I need to do difference. <laughs> difference between men and women, bodies, you want to consider that, and how lifting weight is going to impact on that, or how it is relevant. Weightlifting needs to take place in a safe environment. So you don't want to be on uneven surface. You don't want to be on a floor that is unstable. You don't want to be in an environment where there are lots of other things that you can go into. So all of these are things to consider. Then you might also, as a part of the brainstorming, come up with the notion that barbells versus machines to lift weights and the effect that that has on the body. Like every time I see this total gym ad, I think I want to buy a total gym. <laughs> <laughs> so that versus actually having the weights and now there's this one in kettleball. It's like everywhere I look there's a there's something about a kettleball. Never see it look like a purse. So it looks it's this round ball, it's a ball and it has a handle stuff on it. And they use it to yeah. Like I think P Diddy, I saw that his son's portrait one recently. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um again relating to lifting weights to increase uh, strength for female can it be combined with aerobics you know and would there be results realized from something like that swimming and aerobics work different muscles so even though you're pumping weights to isolate you're isolating specific muscles and working them with the weight can you do some swimming and aerobics and aerobics so help to strengthen yourself overall and then the benefits of improved stamina versus developing strength. So like I know that persons who are training for marathons, they don't just run and run. They run fast, run slow, walk, run and run, fast, slow, walk. So over time they build the stamina more so than just the ability to run very far, very fast. Um, and then the last one, establishing goals are important. So whether these are personal, the, well, personal and individual goals, right? 
So these are all things that could come up from a brainstorming session. Is there anything, when you think about the topic, is there anything else you could add? Anybody? Lira, Kira, Karyan? No? Can't think of anything else? Oh, that's all right. I was just tossing it over there anyway. All right, so another of the free writing activities, so we've gone through two. We have looked at mapping, and we've looked at brainstorming, and then this is another one, free writing, and remember guys, that we're looking at writing process. So these are all free writing activities before you actually start generating the work, right? So look at this example of free writing. Pumping iron. What the steroid drugs call it, and exactly what I do not want to be, I'm also you. Great that Professor Moore told us women's, sorry, women's muscles don't work up much unless a weightlifting program is really intense. They just get longer, which I hear is actually true, that um, women don't do, well, all right, not sorry, no, Williams, that's, that's <laughs> so, <laughs> no work for me, please. <laughs> I just want upper body strength. Oh, and the aerobic stuff from swimming, which makes me feel great. Lift, sweat, swim, lift, sweat, swim, lift, sweat, swim. So this is free writing, just putting down the thoughts on paper. Now, when you look at this, can you determine who the audience is? Is there a purpose defined, context defined, or is it work in progress? Work in progress. It's work in progress, but there are some things that are there because we know that this person does not want, well, she has stated emphatically what it is that she doesn't want. And then she has stated what she actually wants. So we're getting some purpose. Right? It's not yet overly persuasive, but we can assume that that will come eventually. Right? right. Uh, one this question. Of how you can die. Sorry, go ahead, Karen. Um, right. For the free writing process, is it a timed activity? All right. I don't think I understand. Let's start again. For the free writing. Because um, like when I when I give my students free writing, I tell them they have five minutes to just write on the particular topic, and right. anything that comes to mind, they um they just put yeah, it down. It, it, uh, is that it? This is similar with your free writing. You're not necessarily telling them what it is that they should do. This one is suggesting that you skip. This is the first point of entry. So you just start, you just write the first ideas that come to mind, and then over time, I guess those will be refined to go in the direction where you ex exactly where you want it to go. So this is the point of it. This is the first pre-writing activity. So it is supposing that you're not necessarily using brainstorming, or you're not necessarily using the mapping. Yeah. All right. Okay, Carrie. Okay. And then the other option, remember that there were four, right? And this is the last one. Though. So there was brainstorming, then there was mapping. And before this, we looked at free writing, and now we're at the fourth one, which is using the journalist questions. I learned them as using the WH questions. But Generally, they are who, what, when, why, where, and how. And you don't have to ask them in this order. Wait, Kerry, are you saying something to us? Oh, no, you're not. Okay. I'm <laughs> reading. Sorry. Okay. okay. <laughs> your picture is open. That's right. All right. So these are the questions that you can actually encourage your students to ask. And the answers to these will provide some of the information that they need to put in whatever it is that they're writing. So in this particular instance, who? Who are the women who would want to lift weights? All right? And then the one to, remember it was strength. Oh, right. And then what? What is the difference between anaerobic and aerobic exercises? I should know this because of HSB. I was looking at the HSB book recently, but don't ask me. 
right? So what are the benefits of both exercise methods? So notice the what question really is not just one, and I guess you could add any number of what questions here because that will help you to generate information. Another question, when is the best time of day or age or time of life for women to exercise? Like some women just don't want to hit 40 looking hammer, right? Or 50. <laughs> so when do you determine that you should start exercising as a female? And then next question, why? Why do I need to combine a variety of exercise types? in my quest to build a better body? Which is a very good question, because we're learning over time now that, you know, if you want to lose weight off the stomach, you don't just exercise the stomach, that's not going to work. You have to exercise some other parts of your body, all right? Why is safety an issue in exercising? So this is another question that will generate in answers that you would put in your essay. Where? Where do I go to pump iron and also, have a variety of machines and technical support at my disposal. Is that to have a home gym? Or do you need to go to join a gym? <laughs> or are you just going to use something to have in your backyard? But these are decisions that you have to make when you decide that you want to have a particular type of body. And then the last question here, how will this help me in the long run? Career, personal goals, etc. And we can think about whether you have a family, how this will affect them. So there are any number of questions that we can encourage our students to ask. And what I have found, particularly for literature, these are good questions to get them to look into the content. So I'm going to now ask, because we're writing across the curriculum, I'm going to ask the different um, subjects represented, like Spanish, French, is there any scope for using, I, I know there is scope for using free writing, so I didn't think to ask for that one, but is there any scope for asking these journalist questions depending on the type of activities that you're doing? So this is specifically for Kira and Sasha. Oh yes, yes. Oh, just I'm just asking, like, are there instances when you're trying to encourage students to write, are there instances where you can encourage, you can use any of these questions? Because you don't have to use all of them. Yes. There is no reason for you to use all of them. All right? Just the ones that are relevant. Yes, um, because uh, our type of writing is probably contextual. Mm -hmm. um, those questions will be very useful, especially in school, because you have to think about the formalities when you're talking about two versus two and right, as opposed to two French, and who said in Spanish instead of uh, two. So the journalist questions. Okay, they will they last one. Two. Okay. So perhaps then you can start. Well, they're, they're all they're all ready. Okay. And you find the same hero? Yes, um, for Spanish they would have to use I think all the other questions you have there, who would tell them are you being um formal or is it an informal situation? Um who are you referring to? Yeah, what, when? Yes, they would have to use all of these those questions at some point in the writing. So what I want you guys is that as we're looking at these, I want us to think of how they're applicable to our own area, right? And at a primary level, because they have to do, oh, they just have to be using these questions for everything like that. Yeah. However, the original question on the speech is comprehension, and they started in our way.
Alright, sorry guys, we're starting some people. Alright, um where were we? Right. So we're talking about the relevance of these journalist questions. Nero, I suspect they might be relevant for you as well. Yes, they are. Okay. Um, right. Even if they do not write like situational essays, because usually they give them mm -hmm. what they're supposed to, they are important right. for them to to guide their writing. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm seeing I'm seeing how like who, when, mm -hmm. what, what, yeah, I'm seeing all these when, when right. where, why they yeah. they are important. Yes. Right. So. Is there any possibility that we can start, like, just when we're thinking about these things, draft out like little rubrics or little cues to help the students to, when they're writing, or when you, when you design a task for them to do, just do something to the side to say, okay, these are the ideas that I want my students to, this is how I want to generate ideas, by brainstorming, and you probably show them how, or free writing or using the journalist questions, you know, you guide them with their writing. All right, so start, when you do your task, start thinking of these things. All right, so we're presuming that we would have generated these ideas ourselves, we did these. And so, because this is, remember that question you asked earlier about students writing about unfamiliar things? So imagine that this was something unfamiliar. When you see from brainstorming, how many things could have come, right? And which is exactly what Vernon was saying. It's going to be difficult for something to be completely at the C-set level, at the high school level. What they give them to you should be so completely unfamiliar that they cannot enter into it. So even if it is something historical or geographical that seems to be in the medium, no. Even though they may not be paying attention to the news, there should be something to trigger an idea for them to actually start thinking about it within a wider context so that they're able to say something. So after they have come up with these ideas, something we want to encourage our students to do because really they don't know everything. There is no one person who is going to know everything. So encourage them to go and do some research. If it's even one other source, go read something. And these days, lots of articles are online what we can probably start doing is help them to discern what is a credible source versus what is something they want to avoid because the credibility is going to make a difference. Right? And I know that libraries are going out of fashion, but if possible, we can still encourage them to use the school's library to go to check some reference texts and you know, just read something that will help them to generate some ideas. All right, so it says you're having a wealth of information that is not effectively organized will not help you in the writing process. So we have all that information from before, all right? How do we know? Let's say we had brainstormed, for example, and then we had mapped all that information on the web. How do we know move it from the web into something that is readable? And that is going to be prose that is reader based, right? And this is where an outline comes into play. We want to help the students to understand. And always, there should be some idea that there is flexibility with an outline. So it's not a hard and fast rule. Once they put it down, it's not carved in stone. So just the idea though is that an outline will help them to organize concepts. This is where I'm going to begin. Then I'm going to move to this next idea. Then I'm going to move on to that and I'm going to move on to that. Earlier, Vernon mentioned that depending on the type of writing, he encourages, well, he encourages students to take a very structured approach. And the approach usually is based on the type of writing. So how do they organize is that they're using compare and contrast and sometimes the question will tell them that this is what they're supposed to do. Is it that they are list, they're putting things in a sequence? Is it that they're moving from most important to least important? Are they using spatial oral? So 
we, everybody, every single teacher needs to become, I guess, often with the different ways in which information can be organized within writing so that we can help our students to structure their writing in that fashion. And one of the things that we can begin by doing is looking at the way the questions are structured because some questions will say compare and contrast. Some will say list whatever. Others will say discuss or define or analyze. So when they look at those keywords, it should give them an idea of what is required and then from that, they should be able to know, use, use that concept of outline how they're going to write what it is that they need to write. So let's look now at an example of an outline, right? And we're all familiar with the concept of a thesis statement. Yes? I'm sorry, again, guys. I'm sorry. I know that SL2 something is here. So, did you ask for relevance? Oh, one of it on the new side. But it's along, I know that SL something 2A is here, which means that. It's somewhere up here. All right, so let us know where you this. All right, thank you. All right, sorry again, guys. So this is an example of a sentence online. I think we just have sentences that indicate what's going to make up these paragraphs. And we're starting with the idea of a thesis statement. Do we all understand what a thesis statement is? We all understand? All right, so I know that Lyra is nodding because I can see Lyra on screen. But um, carry on, Kira. Right, yes, I understand thesis statement. Okay, Kira? Yes, I do. Okay, good. So we want to encourage, and this is where a personal experience having opinions is going to be important. So the thesis statement, and I'm going to go back a few slides so that we can see how we have moved from this broad idea and narrow it down to this thesis statement, all right? So the thesis statement, when you look at it, that is going to tell you the direction in which this whole piece of writing is going. And this one says, with the right training, women can also pump iron successfully for increased strength and stamina, all right? And remember earlier, let's go back a few slides. The assignment was write an essay of 700 to 800 words in which you discuss a challenge you faced and tried to meet. So would the challenge be weightlifting? Uh, yes. Right, so in this case, the challenge would be weightlifting. And the topic was further narrowed. So this is the assignment given, and what the person chose to do was that was um, weightlifting for women who want to build their strength. And then she further narrowed that. Oh, so this thesis statement, which reads, with the right training, women can also pump iron successfully for increased strength and stamina. So does this relate to the original assignment? Yes, it does, because she's going to now go on to show how this is a challenge that can be met. All right? I'm not sure if history or geography at the CSEC level facilitates this. Or in this side. Definitely, definitely the history. The history. You have, to, okay. you have to write thesis statements for every paragraph in the SBAs. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. So I, but I doubt the same applies for Spanish and French. No, yeah, yeah, not at the not at the C level. Not at the C okay, but at the K level, yes. Okay. All right. So it says here, this is now our first paragraph. The right training lets women who lift weights avoid developing massive muscles. And then it goes on to list the things that are to be considered there. For example, women's biology and biology plays a role in this. 
next company exercise types play a role in this. And so you can see how if you are able to organize your thoughts, so imagine that we're taking this from the web. If you're able to organize your thoughts, then you can have a coherent essay moving from one paragraph to the next, to the next. We're seeing that, we look at this. Is there anything here that looks like it shouldn't be there? For example, on the women's biology plays a role. Women don't produce much of the specific muscle bulking for bones, true. Women's muscles tend to grow longer rather than bulkier, again, true. So is that, that bit of information is going to be necessary right where it is? And then in the next, it says combining exercise types plays a role. Anaerobic exercise, like we're eating, builds muscles. Aerobic exercise is like, sorry, exercise like swimming, builds endurance and stamina. Right? So again, it shows you, it, these are examples of how doing the right type of exercise will have a particular type of effect. And we could go through for the rest of the slides and you will see that each paragraph pretty much is developed along the same line. So it tells you what the topic sentence or what the main idea is in that paragraph and then it indicates what the supporting ideas would be. All right? I'm going to email this to you so I'm not going to go through all of these because they're really just more of the same. But there's not three, three judges the, the students. Um, the writing style and, and, and the expression. Okay. We are discussing that. All right. Did everybody hear what Vernon? I don't know. I don't teach. I think even without teaching, I can teach all of them. Okay. All right. Did everybody hear Vernon's question? No, I didn't. Uh, can you repeat himself? All right. So Vernon's question is, if this approach will really restrict the students, whether it is in their creativity or their yes. expression, all right? And is there anybody who wants to take up and who wants to respond to this before I do? That if you write an outline, you run the risk of restraining students, you put them in a straight jacket, so to speak? No, I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say so, unless they didn't have they don't have enough um uh, experience with with using an outline. But you still have creativity. What you have here are the ideas, mm -hmm. and so the ideas are outlined. It gives you the organization, but that doesn't leave out that doesn't you still have room there for style, because if you only if you only um included these ideas, it really would sound like a straight jacket essay. And it wouldn't flow. You would now have to include your personal style and um, your contrasting ideas, your, your um, transitional phrases to make it um, really pop. Okay, all right. Um, anybody else? Going once, twice, three, gone. Well, I agree with what Karen says. I don't think that it would restrict the expression because it depends on the student is the one that's writing. I mean, these are just, this is just an outline. Um, and if you do not allow the students to do that outline, what happens is that the writing usually ends up um, with a lack of coherence. So that, that is really a good, good way. I don't think that it would limit the expression. Okay. Who, wait, Miss Williams, question. Who is who who creates this um, outline? The teacher or the students? The students. No, what I normally do, like um, when I'm teaching them or just exploring the writing process, we usually do something very similar to this, where we come up with a topic, or I take a topic to class, and we narrow it down until we get the thesis statement, and we do the well, before we get a thesis statement, we do the whole brainstorming, mapping thing, just so to get the ideas generated. And then we arrange it in an outline so that they see how we move from reading a question or a task on a paper to actually creating an outline. And sometimes we would actually go on to write because you want them to be able to do this independently. You don't want to rely on you all the time. But it is important for them to learn at least how to generate it. And under exam circumstances, they don't have the time to do something as specific as this. But you want them to at least gather their ideas and say, okay, this is, I need four paragraphs to answer this question. 
and these are the four ideas, back, 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 and they put it down. So you want them to get to that outlining stage, all right? Right. So, do I still need to answer the question? No, no. I have some. You mentioned something. The, the fire paragraph. I have some. I have never been able to do it. To do this right. Right. I don't. I don't. I think it's straight. It's straight. Okay. I All right. Know. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so the question. let me. My take on this is it depends on the writer. And why this is this approach is important for me. Earlier you said that there are some persons who are able, to mention Fidel Castro. I said that there are some persons who is almost as if they have the script in their heads. Most of our students don't, right? And remember that within an examination contest or within most of the writing contests within which the students engage, there is there are marks allocated for very specific things. Organization is one of them. I don't know about anybody else, but I can be very all over the place. All right. So I've been talking about blue and something yellow catch my eye. Oh, look at that. You don't want your students to be writing like that. So it is important to get them to that point where they can harness all the thoughts. And then having harnessed those thoughts, they can arrange them in a way that is going to be sensible for them to put on paper and for somebody to read. Okay? So it's not intended to be a straight jacket. This is a suggestion. So two things. Kira, not Kira, sorry. Lira said that this is an outline. What I want to add to this is that it really, as well as being an outline of how it should be arranged, it really is a suggested outline because even though they're generating it, they don't have to stick slavishly to it. There are things that can be deleted and things that can be added. All right, and then I don't remember. Okay, I don't remember exactly what um what what Carrie Ann said, but what I a part of it I remember is that she said that when you do this, you can add style. So what this is is like the muscle of you know let do that. They replicate the the dinosaurs from Jurassic Park, and you only see this right. So you see the skeleton. So this is the skeleton. And then when you flesh it out, you see whether this is a T-Rex or some other type of something sort of, right? So this is just the bare bones. What the writer will take to this or what the writer will add to this is what is going to make it recognizable as his or her personal style. Because as you said, you could add the different rhetoric techniques to this now. Are you going to be using contrast? That sort of thing. All right, so we, we're good? Yeah? So having pretended to go through the entire writing process, where we've got, to, no, sorry, not the entire writing process. We have gone through the idea of free writing, brainstorming, um, mapping, and what was the last one? Using the journalist questions. So we did those pre-writing activities. We're going to pretend that we did one. And then, having done that, we were able to narrow our topic. We came up with what the challenge was that we wanted to say that we were able to meet and conquer. And then, we got an outline. So, notice how this is vastly different from that initial activity that we did, which was to, in 250 words and in 10 minutes, describe a challenge and how you were able to resolve it or something along those lines. So this is a more process-driven approach, but this is one that is going to ultimately give you a better writing experience, right? So what we did, we narrowed the topic, we generated ideas, there's an understanding of the importance of reading secondary sources, so always encourage your students to go and do some extra research where possible, all right? Which means that you're not going to be testing them on things that they don't know anyway. So even if it's a test circumstance, they would have already been, that they should have already prepared by you know, doing some study. We also formulated a thesis statement, and then from that, we're able to organize an outline. So what do you think the next thing is that we're going to do? We're going to write the actual essay. Right? 
So we have written the essay and we, we did the first draft. We'll put it down and we'll come back and we'll look at it and we edited it. And so now we're going to look at how to actually do that part, revising and editing. So when you revise, because we always said that the first piece of writing is never going to be the best, right? So when you revise, you really are looking at it and you what I like to do. How many times before I do so what I like to do? How many times have you written something and when you read it back, you see a knot, even like you know the knot is supposed to be there, and even though the knot is not on the paper, you read that sentence with the knot. Or worse yet, you include the knot that is not supposed to be there. So he's not reliable. When really what you want to say is he is reliable. And when you read it back, you don't see that word. It's like it's not there. So when you revise, and what I like to do really is even for a few hours, if I have that luxury, is to put it down because I'm going to think about some other things. And when I come back, it's with fresh eyes. So it's almost as if I am seeing it for the first time. And it's almost as if somebody else wrote it. So you really can look at it and you should be able to see some of the inconsistencies. So is there anything wrong with the sentence structure? Are you using the right grammatical conventions where they're supposed to be? How is your paragraph structured? Right? And just generally, how does the whole thing look together as a piece of composition or a piece of an essay? So revision pretty much is very important because it allows you to see the work again. Editing, now this is when you actually go in and you make the corrections that need to be made. If there are run on sentences, you correct them. Sentence fragments, you make the necessary changes. And I think we're all very guilty of a lot of the grammatical errors when we write. It's not until we're looking at them a second time that we know that you know, there are some things that we need to change because how we think it is not always how we write it. So you edit for everything that you can. Grammatical correctness, expression, style, etc., etc. Now the guiding principles of revision. Stay true to your, that should be purpose. Stay true to your purpose for writing. So remember that for this example that we're looking at, the, the thesis statement says that with the right guidance, etc., etc., then you can accomplish what you want. We can all change that and then start talking about what you went to get involved, keep your account, keep your pump iron. That wouldn't make any sense. So when you are revising, Remember what the purpose is and stick to that. Don't insert anything that shouldn't be there. And what you remove from it are the things that need to be taken up because they're not staying true to your purpose. You also want to pay attention to the way the information is organized, where the content is put on, the content is put on the paper. Because if you don't, remember that organization is important to the development of the ideas. So you can't just be randomly putting things on the paper or not correct them if there appears to be some sort of randomness. And what is important here is that we also use transitional phrases. I don't know, like, um, like Kira, I'm going to be, Kira, Nira, Sashaan, I'm going to be calling on you guys a lot to say some things to us. I, I know for English that we focus on transitional words and phrases as we move from one paragraph to the next. Is this something that is emphasized in, not for Spanish or French, I suspect because not writing essays at the CSEC level. Right? Right. Um, it would have been more geared towards K. K again, because yeah. letter, you're not writing. Right. right. But we still teach them how to transition in that sense. You're teaching them a second language, basically. They have to learn it. They have to be able to communicate. Our aim, rather, is to allow them or to foster them to communicate as if it is their native tongue. Right. So all those aspects of English would have been included in it yeah. as well. It is more public at the cave level that we will actually stress the transition and the connection of sentences. 
Mm-hmm. Right. 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 I, I, I suspect the same applies for you, right? So I'm just going to jump to the hero. Because of how geography and history are, um, those subjects are structured, and the writing that they have to generate, I suspect that it would make life easier if they understood the use of transitional phrases, like on the other hand. Similarly, are you able to get students to use these? I try. <laughs> they don't always do it, but I, I mean, that's not my role. But I, I do try to teach them that, um, well, I usually argue with them about what they learn in English because I don't see it in the writing. But I try, yes, they do use it, especially in the history. In the geography, sometimes when they are asked to compare or contrast um, two countries, like uh-huh. industries, economic industries, Sometimes they ask them to compare and contrast, so that's when it comes in handy. But mostly for the history, yes. Okay, just another thing that for the Whatever they write, they tend to write in Spanish and French. It reflects what they know in and English. use and practice in English. So if they don't use other transition words in English, you're not gonna find them using them in French. So it's almost as if it's transfer of learning. No, not transfer of learning. When, when you, you're trying to get them to do it, it's, it's a structure that they're not used to. So oh. it's almost robotic, like you're programming them to try and use it. And it, 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 it was awkward. Yeah, yeah, because, yeah. Okay, so you hear English teachers, they have to listen to the Alright, um, the next thing is Strive for coherence and cohesion. And we understand coherence meaning that it must be organized logically. Cohesion now speaks to this whole idea of within a paragraph, there has to be unity. So whatever is in that paragraph needs to relate to the topic sentence in that paragraph. So there is the things are better binded together. All right? And I suspect that this is going to be relevant for any type of writing, including history, where they have to do sustained, where they have to write sustained ideas. Be rigorous, but do not get attached to your words and ideas, because guess what? Sometimes you come up with a word or a phrase and we think, well, this is the most fantastic thing, and you really don't want to take it off. It's in your best interest to remove it. Pay attention to that. Don't hang on to it because it sounds attractive. If it's someone attractive, write it somewhere else. <laughs> but if it's not working for that essay, take it out. Next, you want to consider that when you're revising, you really should improve what is already written. Otherwise, the purpose of revising is entirely lost because you will still be at that first level that one of the theorists had spoken about and you would not have moved to the second level. And this process, this revision process, is intended to move you from that first level of writing to at least to that second level. All right? Re-see, re-see, and re-see your drafts. So this is encouraging you to look at it as a number of times. When you have the luxury of time, some persons are last minute and they will not have that luxury. And then there are other persons who are able to work and have an assignment prepared from a week in advance. Look it over. If you have, if you're that person, look it over as many times as you can and fine tune it until you think you have reached that same essay, right? So that's the guiding principles. Those are some of the guiding principles. Other guiding principles, when you're editing, this is specific to editing, focus on mechanics, grammar, and style, and you want to be consistent. Because remember that first verb that you use is going to determine the other verbs that come in your essay. So if you're writing in the first person, only related verbs are going to work. If you're writing in the first person, you're writing in the present tense, that's what I meant to say. So if you're writing in the present tense, only related verbs are going to work. And the same holds true for any other tense you want to use. So pay attention to your punctuation, your tenses, your subject verb agreement. Here are you eating a lot. (laughs) (laughs) 
I know that our students don't love walking around with dictionaries and thesauruses, but if at all possible, I used to have one at Little Oxford Dictionary. I used to have one in my space maker. Yes. <laughs> I don't know, people see the space maker? I don't think so. <laughs> but I used to take a space maker to pass my notes to my marker and stuff. And I also have a little dictionary. Because I didn't walk with a dictionary, I wanted them to have it. So I walk with my dictionary. And we'd all use it. The one who was just respect the dictionary. Don't make it have dog ears and that sort of thing. But we want to encourage them to do that. Use dictionaries, use the sources, because what the thesaurus is going to do is they tell them to expand their vocabulary. Too frequently, our students say nice. Oh, that's nice. What does that mean? Or that's good. You know, so help them to expand those ideas and pinpoint exactly what they want to say. How are they going to do that? With a dictionary or a thesaurus. And then from that, too, they will be able to make decisions of them about the mechanics of their writing. Use your grammar and composition books to assist you with identifying problems of subject verb agreement, tense and past participle verb form, sentence fragments, comma slices, number as it relates to singularity and plurality. All of these things are considerations. No, it's a consideration. Right, I find one that means this is a which list, which ones? I think we have um, You mean the textbooks that the ministry right. supply? Right. Oh, but they don't really supply a grammar composition no. resource. No. They don't. Well, All they give is as a textbook. Right, so no, I think that was that the most areas that are being ignored. So for example, I thought they have grammar composition one. I know that blue book, that little blue book from US. It's the same year's book, but this one is, is yellow. Oh, they okay, have okay, it's, it's it's three of them. There's right. a blue shaded one, a yellow, and that kind of beige. Right. As teachers, they just use that thicker version. Right. I find this very good. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, because I think we use my Right. Yeah. All right. So, looking at more guiding principles of editing, pay attention to word choice and diction. And this is going to be very important when it comes to the Creole interference. Because remember, a lot of our students, they, because the word sounds English, they never consider that the meaning might not actually be English or that it might not be, they might not be using the word in an English context. So we want to pay attention to, we want to pay attention to that to help them to be able to pay attention to it. Sentence variety and expression of ideas. No. In the initial stages when students are learning to write, they perhaps tend to do simple sentences. And then as they become more sophisticated writers, you're probably going to see some errors, some run-on sentences and some sentence fragments. And what that probably means is that they are learning to make complex, or they at least understand that there is such a thing as a compound or a complex sentence. Once you're able to them, come to it properly, then you should encourage them to make these compound and complex sentences because that level of sentence variety adds a sophistication to their work. And this is applicable to all subjects. Perhaps not so much French and Spanish but at the C set level or at the secondary high school level, the lower secondary high school level, simply because of how those subjects are presented. Right? Stay away from contractions, but we know this. When it is formal writing, we cannot use phrase and words like can't, don't. You have to write cannot, do not, will not. So try to get them to avoid those sorts of expressions completely. That way they won't slip and actually put them in their work. Abbreviations. Again, they're not expected for formal writing and anything that they generate for us in school is going to come under the heading of formal writing, so no abbreviations, no colloquialisms, no slang expressions, no cliches. These are things that you want them to just avoid completely. And if the jargon is not related to a particular topic, 
then discourage the use of it. In some instances, there are some words that you will have to use, or some expressions that you will have to use because it's very topic related. But just under general circumstances, you want to tell them that leave out anything that sounds that it's street jargon. Observe the conventions of good writing, and that is going to have to do with your paragraphing, you know, how you use capital, send capital letters because they don't appear in the middle of words and all of that sort of thing. So when we are writing, we need to practice these things and we need to encourage the students to write and then edit. I'll send these to you a little later on so if you have that reference. Now the next few slides include the essay that we wrote. Yes. So let me see, it's quite a few, it's quite a bit. I don't even know if I really want us to look at this. I think I'm probably going to issue this. I'm going to send it to you. But I think what I'll do is I'll have you look at the rest of this for a bit of homework because there are some questions. For example, this slide has some questions about the positive features and then, well, it has to look at the positive features and the negative features of the paragraph, of the third paragraph. So I would probably have you look at this separately because it's quite a bit. We can discuss this in the next class. And then, so that's, you see whole stuff piling up on you to do in the next class? <laughs> yeah, and so just looking, pretending that we have gone through that essay, we would have so far narrowed our topic, we're adding to it, We've generated ideas. We would have gone as far as formulating the thesis statement, organizing the sentence outline, writing the first draft, and revising the first draft. So this really has just walked you through the process. And even though I should remind you that even though it has taken a linear approach, remember that when you are writing yourselves, you might not necessarily take a similarly linear approach. In fact, it is highly unlikely because as I say, you write the first paragraph and you read it over. You are actually revising and you might change a few words here and there, move a full stop. You are actually engaged in editing, right? So you don't have to wait until the end. It doesn't have to be as beginning to end as this because that is going to be entirely dependent on your writing style. Am I losing anybody? All right, so we're all still here. Right, let me stop share this a little bit. We're all still here? Okay, so I see Lira nodding. Kira? Yes, I am. Yes. Okay, carry on. Why does carry on screen always freeze? Oh, Lord. Okay. Oh, just as we left our back again. All right, so I'm going back to share screen. And so let's give the writing process a try. We're not necessarily going to do an essay when we really don't have time for this, and this is not a normal, not a normal situation. But just generally now for discussion purposes. How important do you think these um, writing skills, sorry, how important are effective writing skills for students at the secondary level? And this is just a kind of wrap up discussion for this slide. Anybody can say, you're writing at the secondary level, you're writing for Spanish and French in a little bit different way from how you write for English and certainly in a different way from how you write for geography and history. But how important is it for all students to understand that there are writing skills, and if they master this, it can affect the way they write. Wait, one second. Um, Kira, can you hear what Vernon is saying? No, so Vernon has to speak up. I think this is extremely important. Um, Better now? Right, because certainly know that if they have um, competent uh, writing skills for this language, 
it translates to the other subjects. Mm -hmm. um, it, it helps, um, for example, a teacher of state grade science was giving them an extended piece of writing to be able to see uh, what is it that their thoughts are focused on, uh, to see a sequence of um, ideas, um, to see coherence in terms of all the material is delivered. So, mm -hmm. so and, and as I keep telling my students that if you can write for the English language, then you can write for the most other subjects. And you can think for the mathematics. Um. Lunch. Okay. Okay. All right, so we're going to take a break. We're going to take a break at 1.30 and then we'll go for All right, so we'll get to there. Thank you. All right, guys, sorry about that. That was a little confusion about our lunch. <laughs> so we're going to end at 1.30, which is a few minutes from now. It's not exactly what we have planned, but that's what it's going to work out. But Vernon was saying that. It is important understanding that there are writing skills and actually harnessing these writing skills is important to help students to become masters at writing. Because once they understand that there are writing skills, then they will pay more attention to how they sequence information, you said? How they arrange information. How they uh, communicate. How they communicate effectively, all right? Is there anybody else who wants to say something? And the students have to understand that their writing is not just for the teacher. Eventually, they have to write maybe for a boss, maybe for a university, and you want them to know how the, what the proper way of doing it is. Yes, I like that. So pretty much you're saying that writing is not just for this moment, for secondary experience, or for the teacher, like some persons, like some students believe that when they do writing, you know, it's the teacher's work that they're doing. But they're actually writing to learn skills that will become applicable for their lives later on. Very good. All right, anybody else? Once, twice. Okay, so we're gone. <laughs> so we're not, we're not asking that question anymore. All right, guys, just to quickly recap what it is that we looked at today. Whoa, that's a lot of writing your that's a lot of notes. That was from last <laughs> Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. So for today, we were able to look at the nature of writing. How it is that our students enter into writing and what are the considerations? that we need to keep in mind. Theorists have their different perspectives. Some believe that it is cognitive. Some believe that there is a writer-based approach versus a reader-based reader approach. And of the seven, you'll find the one that with which you are most closely aligned, aligned, but please ensure that you know what other persons or the other theorists think so that you don't neglect to see how it is affecting your students' writing. Yeah? So we know that there are different perspectives related to writing, but ultimately what they all agree is that there is some sort of process involved. Right? You don't just get it right on the first go. You actually have to invest some time in developing, looking at your ideas, in thinking about what it is you want to write, in talking to other people, or maybe sometimes it's just a matter of talking to yourself in front of a mirror. You have to write something, and then you have to, it's best to get some sort of feedback so that you can go ahead and further refine. Now, how you want to look at this process of writing is entirely dependent on you as a writer. But there are certain things that you have to bear in mind. One, it's not linear or it's not always linear, because this is going to be dependent on writing style, on experience, on sometimes the topic that you're writing about. So there are some things that we must cover though, no matter how you enter into writing, there are pre-writing activities. And we remember what those are? Anybody name one? Mapping. Mapping is one? Brainstorming. 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 
using journalist questions. questions. Right. So there are pre-writing activities, good, that you can do to enter into writing. You don't have to do all four. You don't have to do two of the four, but maybe you can combine whichever ones work best for you. Just expose your students to them and encourage them to use the ones that work for them. Um, something else to we need to consider with as part of this writing process is that you write your first, well, sorry, don't let the first word down drafting. It's good to outline your ideas so you have that guide going into writing. And once you have that first draft, you want to put it aside so that you can revisit it later, make whatever revisions are necessary, make whatever editing decisions you need to make so that you can generate a second draft, which by the way, might not be your final product. Chances are you have to go back into it again, especially if you give it to somebody to look at. If you get feedback on it, you might have to go back to your second draft before you can consider it very, it's like your best work, right? So we are, are we clear about this idea of the nature of writing and writing process? Are there any questions you want to ask? No, not yet? Okay, this is what I am going to do. The two, um, the two core points that we have here today, I'm going to email both of them to you. Uh, I'm going to try to get them posted on OUR daily as well. But there's no guarantee that that's going to work for me, to be honest. So I'm going to try to get them to you. For the first one, the end of the first one, nature, the nature of writing. Remember that there's a reading reference that I had sent to you, right? So I want you to do that reading for class on Thursday. It's going to form a part of our discussion. And then for this one, I don't think I want you to write anything. All I want you to do is to just go through the essay that was actually listed on this and look at how it is developed. Look at the editing process that is detailed on this. And if there are any questions in the next class, we can go through those. But if you don't have any questions, I'm going to assume that's all as well. I should tell you, you have my email address. So if you have a question that you want to ask me, copy everybody in on the email so that I have a question. Out, right? So copy everybody and email me that question so that when I respond, everybody will see it. So feel free to I have me. a question. Oh, sorry. Can I ask it now? Yes. The writing process, um, it seems like something that takes a bit of time. Uh-huh. Um, since I am not in the teaching of, I'm not a, an English teacher, I'm confused as to how you implement this in a class. Because, I mean, I, I know the most that you have is a double period. Mm -hmm. This is the, the most amount. That's just about, what, like one, one and a half hours or so for the most. I mean, how, how do you go about implementing the writing workshop because I mean brainstorming sentence outline revising and then giving them the opportunity to write and then editing revising I, and it seems like a lot I, I don't know all right and I appreciate where you're going with this you have a syllabus that you need to complete or you have a curriculum that you need to cover within the year how much time can you take to really do this if you do it well once you never have to do it again. If you do it, if you take, let us say, a double session and you do this once for the whole year at the beginning, you'll never have to touch it again. One. Two, you don't have to go through the entire process depending on the nature of your subject because, like, this is not really relevant for Spanish and French at this lower secondary and the CSET level. It really only becomes important at the K level when they're in sixth form, right? And again, this is something that would come up, I suspect, when you're teaching them how to write essays in response to the questions. So it would come up anyway as a part of what they do. It certainly comes up in English. Now, as it relates to, say, history, they get essays to write, yeah? 
Right, Leo? Beg your pardon? They get it. For history, do the students get SS to write? Yes, they do. Right. Three SS. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So they get an essay to write. And this process here that we went through today, let us, I don't know what a history essay is going to be. It, does it have parts? Like yes, it does. Some of them, but some of them are whole essays that, that, that the writing um, process really, really would help a okay. lot. So what I'm pointing out here is you can take, for example, a question from CX, one of those questions. I would do one that is just like, it doesn't have any parts, and I would do one that has parts, because with the parts, it's going to show them what should be in each paragraph more easily than if it is just a whole statement or question, right? Mm -hmm. And I'd probably just take one class, maybe you would be in another session, and really walk them through how to organize their thoughts. So what you would go to class with is just the writing process, looking at the question, taking out what are the important words that they need to focus on, right? Yeah, another sentence, another sentence, another sentence. Yeah. So, <laughs> identify those important words that they must pay attention to, okay? And then from that, help them to brainstorm. What are the ideas that they need to include to answer this question and get the most of the marks or get all of the marks? Whether it is brainstorming or mapping or free writing, free writing I probably wouldn't do with them at this age, or using the journalistic questions, you can help them to harness the information and then outline how it is to be shaped within the essay. You can help them to generate it or you can do it all by yourself just to help them to see how it can be done. And then the assignment would actually be for them to go and write the essay. Because that's what I used to do. I used to go away from class, write the essay, come back, and I would have like a peer evaluation rubric. And I would say exchange it with a friend or a partner or somebody. And using the rubric, look at what is written. And they don't have to do this in class. That can be a homework assignment. And so some of the editing would have occurred outside of class. They're going to get the feedback. When they come back, you said to them, all right, return the assignment, return the paper, go home, make the necessary changes. By the time you get it, it is almost, or it is probably as perfect as a student can get it at that level. So you can tailor this process to suit your circumstances. You don't have to do all of it all at once. And what I have learned is, as the students become more familiar with the outlining, then they don't necessarily have to include that level of detail where under each for each paragraph they have eight sentences. You know, you won't need to do all of that. Perhaps for like a paragraph, once they say what a paragraph is going to be, what's going to be in the paragraph, they're able to say, okay, point one, point two, point three, and they move along. So it becomes easier the more they practice it. Right? But are you going to give it a try though? And you don't have to do it with I, your... I will, I will. It seems yeah, like a very good thing, yes. You, you could try with the lower school first and see how it works or how much time it takes. And then, you know, over time, you refine the process until it works. What is happening? Oh. Okay, sorry, we just disappeared for a Right, so over time, it will become easier. And you can just see once you try, you try it, you can just see how it really works for you and what you need to do to adjust it for each set of students. All right. The other thing I wanted to look at, and I did not print it off, is the, I wanted to just briefly, just quickly mention the portfolio. The first piece of writing on it, Sorry, what is it? Um, it says explaining no more than reflection on the nature of writing. Right. So they're explaining no more than coded words, your understanding of a theorist, theory of writing. And making sure to discuss the theorist's conception of the stages that facilitate good and effective writing. And you're not to use flowers. Yeah, but well, I didn't go very much in depth with flowers. So I, the plan was to go more in depth with flowers. But so I'm going to say you can go ahead and do flowers. So of the seven theories that were on the slide this morning, 
you are to do, you are to start working on your first piece of a journal entry. And that is in 400, about 400 words. So pretty much summarize one theorist. All right? And it would be good if you were to have the first draft by next week. Initially, I said by Thursday, but that seems a little bit hard. So by next week, it would be wonderful if you were to have the first draft so that we can now engage in practicing the same editing, the revising and editing skills that we would have explored today. All right? Yeah, so we're going to go on. No, just, just the one. Oh. Just part one. <laughs> just part one. I'll tell you when to do the others. And remember that it is electronic, so you're doing this to submit by all. Yeah. You will just submit it by all you are organs, right? Yeah. All right, guys, so I am so, going to. So the three ESM. I don't understand what ESM means. Three yeah. pieces for your portfolio. Mm -hmm. No man, for the course overall. No man, just for you gave us three in this three. Mm -hmm. oh. So one is to go to the four point and go to the this and then just send it. Oh the trip is nothing that you're supposed to do, yes. And then the one that you just put up for the first one. What do you do with the first one? The first one is to do read that article that I sent you from is Britain? No. Uh, uh, About the changes. Right, right, right. Right, right. So to read that, I'll send you the four point that Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. All right. So I will see you guys on Thursday, and we're going to begin looking at paradigm shifts in writing instructions, which is why the changes in writing instruction becomes important for that discussion. All right, guys? So remember to email me if you have any questions. And I'll email this to you. I'll email these, these two PowerPoints to you so that you have them for reference. All right? Is there anything else you guys need to say? No? no. Sorry, Kira? No, I have no questions at this point. Alright, no questions. And are you comfortable with what we have covered today? Pardon? Are you comfortable with what we have covered today? Yes, yes. Okay, if I bore you, please let me know. Alright? <laughs> yeah. Alright, Terry? <laughs> Lira? <laughs> no, you don't want to say it. Alright, fine. Be like that. Alright, so until Thursday, guys, we will we'll see you. All right, bye.